Well, um, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever the time we, uh, we're at right now. Uh, my name is Moses Rodriguez. You know that I'm a, a city councilor here in Brockton, but today I'm actually here on behalf of the uh, Cape Verdean Association of Brockton because as um, most, you, most of you must know by now, about a year or so ago, the association wrote a grant to the Small Business Administration, and it was a very competitive grant with somewhere around 700 uh, applicants nationwide, and we were one of 51 selected nationwide to be part of this grant. To basically be uh, a navigator, a community navigator to help small businesses navigate um, the, the process of helping their business. So one of the things that we told the, uh, the Small Business Administration that we would do is because as you know, Brockton right now is the only majority black city in New England. The only one. The only majority black city in New England. But guess what? I think we're the only ones who know that because very few things that we do represent that. So one of the things that we had told the uh, SBA that we would want to do as one of the goals here is to create this Greater Brockton Small Minority Business Association to work along with the Chamber of Commerce, the BRA, the Old Pal you know, Colony Planning Council, a variety of other organizations, but to basically gather those businesses that have been somewhat left out uh, because of language barriers, because of understanding. So what, what we've been doing since November, we've been kind of organizing these, um, these small businesses, and to date, we now have over 130 businesses affiliated with this group. So we have legalized this organization. I mean, we're still doing the SBA um, things that we're supposed to do through the grant process. Again, it, it, it's not, I heard from a few people saying, oh, you got this money from the, the government, now what are you gonna do with it? Well, it came in, you know, when you write a grant, everything is delineated what you're supposed to do with it. We have some partners in the community that we use some of the grants to go with. We were able to hire a few people within the association. We've got a Cape Verdean advocate, a, a Hispanic advocate, and a Haitian advocate to kind of reach out to the various businesses in their own language. So that's what the funding was for. It was never, as a matter of fact, I think I have actually lost out on the grant because one of the things that I proposed in there was to create some funds to help directly some small businesses in the community and they said, uh, 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 that's not part of the navigation process. We want you to help them navigate, not necessarily give them anything. What you're supposed to do is navigate them towards the BRA so that they can get something. Navigate them towards Old Colony Planning Council so that Mary keeps shaking her head, yes, yes, yes. You know, navigate them towards the, the chamber and some of these other, the banks and things like that that can actually help them with direct funding and as well as the, uh, as the federal government. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, but the good thing is that this organization is now a created organization. It's been legalized through the, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, it has um, a EIN number through the, uh, through the, um, the IRS. And we are now a formed organization that we all belong to in terms of the minority businesses in this, in this community. So I'm kind of proud of the fact that we were able to do that and accomplish that within, I mean, the, the grant pro, uh, period started in December, and we're talking about July here, and as of May, I think we were already up and running with this thing. So this has been a, a major accomplishment for this community, um, and we should all be proud of that, of the fact that it's not, it's not designed to compete with any other organizations out there, but it's just to be an aid to some of the existing organizations. And I'm proud of the fact that we have partners in this community. As I said, you know, the, the three major ones that we deal with, you know, the Metro South, the BRA, and the Old Colony Planning Council, as well as the Haitian Community Partners, um, the, the Brockton uh, Alliance of Workers, which is mostly a Hispanic organization, and the Immigrant Assistance Center down in New Bedford is also part of this group, as well as the Cape Verdean Association. So we're we're very proud of the fact that uh, we're getting some of these things done, some of these accomplishments, and, uh, and again, it's something that, uh, you know, for the first time, this city is taking a step in a, in a positive way to do that. And one of the things that the, the, uh, the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association wanted to do is to try to bring some um, respectability or some, um, uh, 
I want to say some um, accountability in the sense to the area businesses. So we, they felt, again, they, not necessarily me, that they wanted to bring some candidates uh, in front of them to talk about what is, what are you willing to do and work with us to help our local businesses uh, progress and do the things that we need to do here in the city. And this is basically what we are here to do, to have a conversation with the candidates, uh, introduce the candidates to the group, but at the same time have a conversation so that, you know, once you get up there, once you're at the, uh, at the state office, you remember who we are and know that you're a, we are a partner here in the community and show us your willingness to work and do what we can. And we're not going to sit here and ask for, you know, dumb things, but we're going to say, you know, we're asking for, um, to look out for the, uh, the Brockton businesses, the Brockton area businesses, because this is not just Brockton, it's the surrounding communities. Uh, and you're going as far as, you know, Taunton in the sense, and you bet fit in, in some instances, up to Randolph, so it's not just the, uh, uh, the Brockton, but the greater Brockton. So I just want to welcome everybody. I don't want to talk a lot because my voice, as you can tell, is a little on the horsey side. I just came back from uh, Cape Verde, where we had a, uh, a Brockton young man, a Brockton High School graduate who we sent to study uh, in Cape Verde and in Portugal. He was just ordained a priest uh, last Sunday. And so we went there for the ordination and uh, hopefully he'll be coming uh, at the end of next week, at the end of next week where he's gonna celebrate a few masses for us here in the city of Brockton. But think about that, a Brockton, Brockton High School graduate went to study overseas and he's now a priest within the Catholic Church. So that, again, it's uh, something that we ought to all ought to be proud of for the fact that he represented us. And that's the first thing that he talks about. Hey, I'm Brockton, you know, which is kind of cool. So uh, I'm glad uh, I was part of that to witness that. And, and again, I just want to welcome you all to this event. And uh, again, consider us all friends and, um, and partners. And I'm going to pass on the microphone to the young lady that's actually going to moderate this and, and do, I'm sure, a lot better of a job than I would do. She's prettier, she's got a better voice, you know, she can do a better job. So, Jamie? Thanks, Moses. So, good evening and welcome to the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association's first conversation with the candidates. My name is Jamie and I sit as a clerk on the Greater Minority Business Association Board and I will be your moderator for the evening. To start, we have three candidates that are running for State Senate, Second Plymouth and Norfolk, um, and two candidates who are running for State Rep, the 11th Plymouth District. Before we start, we just want to just say a few things that each candidate is going to be given five to seven minutes to speak about their platform. After the candidate speaks, members of the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions to the candidate. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we will come to you with the microphone to ask that question. Once each candidate has finished, um, there will be opportunity at the end to, um, for candidates to address the audience with final remarks. It's not in order, hold on, I messed up. Okay, I got ahead. Okay, so um, now we're gonna begin our candidate conversation. I would first like to introduce our three candidates running for state senate. We have Senator um, candidate up for re-election, um, Senator Michael Brady. Our next candidate running for state senate is Katrina Hoff Larmond. Finally, we have our sticker candidate, Kathleen Krogan Camara. Um, our first candidate up to speak, I would like to welcome Senator Michael Brady. Thank you, Jamie. And, and if I don't do this, my mother up in heaven will be killing me. I was always taught ladies go before gentlemen. So I'm going to pass it over to my uh, friend here who's running for the same seat and start with the ladies, and then I'll go afterwards because my mother will be looking down from heaven on me and giving me the look. So, um, Hi, my name is Katrina Huff Larman, and I am running for State Senate, um, District 34. District 34 is a very special district because this is redistricting. Um, this is a district that has been redistricted. Um, I was involved in the redistricting. Um, that's why I think it's very special because it was developed for equity and equality. And so what happened where when we looked at these districts, 
we said that it's important for individuals who run, who want to run, who feel like they have the, the passion and the patience to run, um, it should be equitable. So um, individuals should feel as if they want, if they run, they could win. And so this is, this is one reason why this district was developed, to make sure that it, it gives opportunities for anyone who has an interest, interest in winning um, and running will have that opportunity when it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to race, when it comes to gender. All of that was taken in consideration when this district was developed. So I'm pretty proud that I have been part of that. So that's enough about the district. That's why it's so special. Um, currently, I am a town councilor in Randolph. So I have had the opportunity to govern a body of, of people in Randolph, Massachusetts. Um, and that is what really motivated me. Well, one of the reasons that really motivated me to why I have this interest in running for state senate. I've, you know, put my toe in the water as a town counselor, I've been at the table and realized what it means to be at the table, realized what it means for a black woman to be at the table and the decisions that I have to make in a majority minority town as in Randolph. And the passion that I have around policy making and the passion that I have for my residents to make sure that equity and equality is, is part of our practices in Randolph, Massachusetts. But I also say, being a town councilor is not the only reason why I was very interested in running for state senate. Many people who have heard me talk before, they know that I am a clinical social worker. And being a clinical social worker means that I have had the opportunity to work with individuals with certain issues that are uh, very prevalent in the in, in the towns, in the cities that we govern, that we live in. As a clinical social worker, I have seen the importance of mental health policies. As a clinical social worker, if it has not affected me personally as an African-American female, indirectly, I have worked with individuals where looking at policies has been very important to understand how could we balance lifestyle, how could we balance, how could we help other individuals um, balance a better lifestyle? So, and, and what, what came out of that for me was saying, I want to bring people with me. I'm not in this race for Katrina Huff Lorman. I'm in this race for the people because I want to bring people to me. As I mentioned earlier, I know the importance of bringing people to the table. It's not my voice that needs to be heard. It's, it's other voices that need to be heard. I want people to sit by me. I want people, I want to hear the issues. And if I could, I would bring a chair up next to me at, um, at the table. But if I cannot, then you can use me for other voices to be heard. Because way too long, many voices have not been heard. And with me at the table, my hope is that all voices will be heard and we will definitely work towards equity and equality. Thank you. Oh, we want this? <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Thank you. Next up we have Kathleen Krogan Kamara. Hi. Thank you. Um, Thank you for hosting. And I'd like to say that, and we would love to work with you uh, in Randolph and other majority minority communities. My district includes many towns in Greater Brockton. That they're, uh, that's their name. You would uh, represent several minority uh, businesses in Greater Brockton. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, tell you why I chose to run for State Senate, why you should vote for me, volunteer, and donate. I'm the only candidate in the race who is pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ plus rights, and pro-immigrant rights. That means that the incumbent 
Walter Timothy is not pro-LGBTQ rights and pro-women's rights, pro-choice, and pro-immigrant rights. There's also a Republican running in the race, and the Republican is not pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ plus rights. I'm a mom and of three grown children. Um, we all had a pretty traditional life until I got divorced and we became homeless. So I scratched and clawed and kicked and yelled my way out of that situation, secured housing for my three small children. It was really, really hard. Then I started running a small business. Childcare was very hard. At times, my next door neighbor, uh, who also ran a business, would say, Kathleen, do you know your kids are climbing on the roof? So you had to know that childcare was a big problem. I was fortunate, more fortunate than most, because sometimes I could bring them to work with me. I ran a small business in this way. I started two beauty salons while I was raising my children. Child care, like I said, was a huge problem, as it is now. I still recognize that it's very difficult for women, and I'd like to fix that. My then teenage daughter, Erin, was in a serious car accident, leaving her with a lot of disabilities. That devastated our family, and I had to get very, very involved in the healthcare system, which is broken. I navigated that system. I fought for my family and I'll fight for you. I had to look for disability services during the pandemic. I went to the state senator's office, the incumbent, to ask for help. And the incumbent said, we are not going to do the heavy lift. I knew it was a heavy lift. I had been doing the heavy lift. It is a heavy lift. Mass Health, Social Security, Medicare, DDS, they're all very busy, complicated, bureaucratic systems that leave people without health care while they wait for answers and while phone calls get dropped and while they plummet into a disastrous medical condition waiting. I want to fix that. I can fix that. I've done that for my daughter. I told people how I had received no help from the incumbent and I heard from so many people of the same situation. As I've knocked on the seven towns and cities in my district, I am hearing horrific stories. Stories that don't get heard. And they're suffering in isolation because they're too busy trying to take care of their situation. Two Randolph women actually recruited me to run because I am the only pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ, pro-immigrant candidate in the race. You should fight, you should vote for me because I'm a fighter and I'll fight for you. I'm the only one that's run a business, raised a family, and I'll take with you, I'll take you with me to Beacon Hill. We need more women on Beacon Hill for a female point of view. Please vote for me. Thank you. And, and first of all, I'd like to thank the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association. I know the Campolo Montel and Downtown Brockton Association will be listening, and if some members are here, I want to thank, thank the uh, Black Owned Brockton, Greater Brockton Young Professionals, the Cape Verdean Association, the Haitian Committee the BHS African American Alumni Association, the Brockton Chamber, chapter of the NAACP, which I've been a member for many, many years, 
and uh, there's a bunch of other organizations. Brockton Interfaith as well, which I've been a member of. Um, and just for clarification, if I may, Ms. Kamari, uh, Kamara, you're, you're running for a different Senate seat, is that correct? So I am running for State Senate for Plymouth, Bristol, 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 Norfolk, and Randolph is a split district. It was gerrymander. Um, I would represent Northern and Central. Randolph, Cortina Huff Lamont represents the other. And I also would represent Milton, Braintree, Stoughton, Easton, Bridgewater, and West Bridgewater. Thank you for that clarification, because I didn't want the public to be confused. Um, uh, our good friend, uh, Katrina Huff Lamont, who's a town council in Randolph, is running for the Senate seat in the Democratic primary, and we have one other Republican candidate that I don't know if they were invited to this, uh, who was running for that seat at all. So as far as I'm aware, there's three candidates running for the seat. And I give anybody credit because this country is a democracy and everybody has a right to run, and we encourage more people to run for office. But I'm grateful to be here. Most of you know me. I want to thank the public that showed up tonight. A lot of you who are here know me, but my name, for those who do not know me, is Michael Brady. I've been born and raised in the district. I come from a very humble family. My parents worked, uh, my father was a construction worker, and my mother worked in the factories in downtown. And in the winter time, we were lucky if we had food on the table and never my Christmas presents. And I've been very fortunate. I was able to work at local businesses, going working at Superior Bakery in Brock and in Malaya News to pay my own way to Massaway Community College. Then I went back and got in the insurance business and went to work at uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance School. I went and graduated from there, got in the insurance business, worked in the, uh, for MetLife, and then later on sat in my own insurance business, and I did business all over the South Shore from Mattapan to Brockton to Taunton to Fall River selling life insurance disability. And at that same time, a lot of people encouraged me to run for office because I was very active in, active in the community, get involved in neighborhood crime arts, the Safe Neighborhood Initiative, volunteering at the libraries. And I ran for the school committee and served one year on the school committee. During that tenure, my predecessor, who was a city council, got appointed to a city solicitor's job, and the council seat opened up, and I, I was asked to run for the council seat. In the middle of snow, three feet on the ground, we had the old wooden signs, and I thank all my supporters because I wouldn't be here without your support, but I had tremendous support from the community. And back then, our schools were not racially divided, uh, racially balanced. They were divided, and we were able to create a racial equity initiative to get 90% reimbursement to build five elementary schools in the city of Brockton. And this is one of the beautiful new schools we're sitting in now. And I want to thank my other elected officials who we had, because we all worked together in our state delegation. My predecessor, Tom Kennedy, who I serve in the seat, he served in, and Bobby Creed. And they were there at the state level working with us as local councils to get that funding from the state. And we were very grateful for that. And uh, also we put funding into a library initiative named after Tommy Kennedy's mother. The first time that we got state lottery funding to build a library, uh, I'm sorry, not as council on aging, and then the library, which uh, was not handicap accessible. Beautiful library built with a Carnegie grant at the turn of the 1900s, but it was never handicap accessible. So never mind a young child couldn't get in there. Our state representative at the time, Tommy Kennedy, couldn't get in there unless you carried him up the stairs. And, and he was a big advocate for libraries, and we named through the efforts of my good friend Jerry Cassie, who serves with myself in the state legislature. We were able to name the library after Tommy Kennedy. So that was a start. And uh, so I served 13 years on the city council. We went through some really good times, got a lot of funding into Brockton. And then when Tom moved on to the state senate seat, I ran for the state rep seat. And we had some great candidates. It was like three cousins running against each other in the Democratic primary. I had some tremendous support. And I prevailed. And I want to thank a lot of the organizations that continue to support me. The Mass Nurses Association is one because I'm a big sport of health care. And when I, when I was a young lad, I got hit by a car. I, I was in the hospital for three months in a coma. And I will never forget people from the community in Brockton and other towns donated blood that I wouldn't be here sitting with you. And I have a soft spot in my heart for health care workers. So I've worked on their behalf when we marched with two strikes at Brockton Hospital, which is now called Signature Healthcare, when they weren't giving fair living wages. And I was grateful to get their support. I also got the endorsement of the Boston Teachers Union, the American Federation of Teachers, the SEIU Local 888, which I was a member of when I worked for the state, the SEIU 1199, the Coalition of Social Justice, uh, labor groups, many men and, and engineers, and many, many other groups. But endorsements alone do not get you elected. Those help. 
But I want to thank the people because the voters are the ones who got me elected. I have a lot of elected officials who are endorsing me and supporting me, whether it be city council or state elected officials, but the most important thing is the voters. And I ask for you for your continued support. I will not be here without your support, and every vote counts. As I mentioned that rep race uh, back in 2008, it was decided by 14 votes, and people think their vote does not count and approves the vote counts. And we had a guy on the school committee years ago in Brockton, the last name was Hancock, famous name in the history of the country. He had people celebrating in his house that didn't get down to vote, and he had lost by three votes. So I ask for your vote. It's so important we get the vote. We did pass legislation to make voting more accessible despite some of the Republicans' efforts to hamper our rights to vote, and they've tried to do it all over the country. They may have succeeded in Texas, but they're not going to succeed in Massachusetts because we have worked very hard on your behalf. So there is going to be an election on September 6th, but there will be early voting, and also they're going to mail out applications. If you are working, I know husbands and wives' schedules are busy. they got soccer practice, baseball practice. Their lives are very busy. So they're going to be mailing out applications to vote. And if anybody needs any help, please contact me, because I'm always accessible 24-7. That's why they have the name Brady Works, because I work for the public. Thank you. Thank you to all of our senator, state senate candidates that are running. Um, now I'm going to open it up to community members. If you have any questions that you would like to ask any of our three candidates, please raise your hand, and we will bring a microphone over to you to ask the question to them. Anyone? Justified. One of them is the tax return of $250 to uh, all taxpayers, except if they're making less than uh, $38,000. That seems to be a little bit off, so maybe you can explain it. it seems to me that the people below $38,000 need it. I'll get $250. Frankly, I don't really need it, and millions of people in the state who don't really need it get that. The second thing that I question is the um, raising of the uh, in, uh, the estate tax limitation from one million to two million. The argument is that all the housing prices have gone up, and of course people now have a lot more wealth that they're going to pass on. But that seems to me a, a perverse response to it. If you paid eighty thousand dollars for a house in Newton in, in 1980. And now it's worth 1.2. What did you do to make all that money? And the answer is nothing. You lived in your house. But those people are going to get a benefit. So it seems to me that there's a taxing of labor. The poorest person pays the 5% on dollar one. And there's benefits to people who have unearned income in a great amount of unearned income as a result of their uh, house that they lived in going up in price. So, and I know there's other tax reforms, but those two particularly animate me. So I'd like to hear a response. I'll be happy to start with that. So there was a couple proposals out there, and as you mentioned, there was some initiatives that did pass in the House of Representatives. They haven't come before, well, there's ideas that come before the Senate. We haven't voted on that yet. And one proposal is, Anybody making from 38,000 to 100,000 if they're single, or 38,000 to 150,000 if they're married, there's a proposal to give the first group that's making 100,000 left if they're single a check for $250. And there was a lot of debate that, that talked about relieving the, the gas tax for the constituents or other things, but if the gas tax relief passed, there was no guarantee that the major corporations would lower their gas prices. So they felt and this is a group that got put forth together in the Senate, because the House had their own version, that got together and weighed out if the people get a check for $250, they can spend it as they wish for food, because food prices have gone through the roof, gas, and, and the money that was allotted, if it gets passed again, would be more money to buy more gallons of gas than if they lower the gas tax. Now that's the first proposal, and, and the other was if it's a couple, they can make up to 150000 
That is still going to be debated. There's still going to be amendments filed, and that's why I'm glad you are here tonight, and I'm willing to listen to the residents who are here or the residents at home. We want to hear from you if you want any change to that. The other part of that that you brought about anybody making 38000 or less, and that was a concern of mine, they're currently getting $500 checks as we speak, and they've gotten other checks in the mail, and we've worked to give them waivers on the rental initiatives and so forth. So that's still being debated. There is another tax proposal that's a big wider range of tax proposals that goes everything from estate taxes and capital gains and other things, and that's about giving people a tax break. The good news at the Commonwealth, because I know the private sector is hurting right now. I mean, the public, the residents, as I mentioned, food prices have gone through the roof. I'm grateful that President Biden opened the border because there was a lot of containers sitting out in the ocean that we couldn't get to the marketplace. There's not enough truck drivers out there. So they're trying to get more products into because we, as you know, we got some oil from Russia, which is a big thing going on with the war over there. I know the president met with Saudi Arabia, whether people were in favor or not, trying to get other oil supplies here. But um, so there was another tax initiative to give a wide range of tax breaks to the residents. So that's two things going on. And then there's one other thing while we're on the subject is the fair share amendment. And this is a proposal that we voted on, but the, the proposal gives money specifically to education or to transportation, which I rose in deplorable shape. They, the Republicans filed some to say it was unconstitutional, so it is another an issue that's going to be coming before all of us. And that is to, to increase the percentage on anybody making above and beyond a million dollars to, to charge them a higher tax rate than everybody in this room probably is making. So that's another issue. An issue. So thank you. Thank you, Brady. Um, do we have the, the, oh, Katrina, would you like to add on something? I would just like to give my two cents. Thank you very much. I'm glad that um, um, Mr. Brady mentioned uh, um, the fair share amendment. Uh, because this, this amendment's really important. We, you know, the cost of living is going up. We need to find initiatives, these tax initiatives, these programs, these opportunities to definitely look at um, affordable housing, to look at the homelessness is going up as, as um, if we're talking about taxes going up, what I'm, I'm really concerned about, and I'm concerned about taxes as well, but I'm also concerned about the homeless population. Um, I'm, I'm also concerned about those who may not be homeless but are having difficulty caring for themselves and their families. And so when we talk about the, the uh, Fair Share Amendment, we must understand that this Fair Share Amendment is, is looking at how do we improve transportation, how do we improve education, because we want to make sure that these important factors that are part of our lives, transportation, where individuals do not have a car um, and they need to get to and back and forth to work. Education, we always want to have the best education um, um, system in place. And so the fact that we are putting money into these programs, putting money into the system from, um, a, a, tax, from a tax program is very important. So I, here to say I'm all for the Fair Share Amendment to make sure that we are able to fund the important pro system programs like education and like transportation. Again, as I mentioned, um, I've been part of the advisory, MBTA advisory board and understanding the importance of transportation, especially in cities like Brockton and towns like Randolph, where it's our livelihood to go back and forth to work and go back and forth to the important appointments that we have in order to take care, to um, have a decent um, lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just one thing, um, we're just going to allow each candidate a minute and a half to respond to the question just because we do still have to get to our state rep. Okay. So um, just a minute for um, the audience to ask a question and then a minute and a half for each candidate to respond. So the Fair Share Amendment is on the ballot in November and you can vote for that. I, I'm definitely for that. Uh, it's going to really help us out. Um, I don't support the $38,000 cutoff. It excludes the people who need it most. I have a press release on that topic this week. I'll also support the Fair Share Amendment, um, which would raise taxes on the people earning over a million dollars. You know, we really, really need to do that. It's really a, a common sense 
um, bill. I'd like to say something about, um, you know, the, the senior citizen who was living in her home in Stoughton just last week that I met who told me that she was so worried about the economy and her rising real estate taxes and being forced out of her home and um, being concerned that her daughter and three children couldn't come and live with her in the community because the uh, rents and mortgages were so high. And we really, really want to keep families together. It's really sad. Um, pertaining to affordable housing, uh, it's a really hot topic uh, right now. Uh, I support more affordable housing in a creative way. I think that we can hold our uh, local uh, officials accountable, and I certainly would, you know, assist in that to to make efforts more creative. And uh, throughout the district, I support the state 40B program to cr create more affordable housing while encouraging mun municipal governments to enforce. And uh, I don't think it's creative enough. I think that we can work together on that. Thank you. Marlene has a question coming over. Thank you. So uh, as you know that Roe versus Wade has been overturned. So I am asking, I'm going to start with Senator Brady. I am asking, what is the plan as our senator right now to make sure that women's rights are protected? And you ladies, as prospective globally, so what is the plan, what you plan to come on your tricks, on your back, to bring to the state house to make sure that our rights are protected? And the providers that helping us as women their rights as well are protected. So what is the plan? What policy that you are thinking to uh, work on to make sure that we all are protected? Thank you, Marlene, and that's a great question. And as you mentioned, Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Justice Court, but Massachusetts voted to protect a woman's right to choose and, and also voted to protect reproductive rights. So even if a woman or her, her and her spouse do not want to have an abortion, they got to protect their health. So to protect reproductive education and rights and all of that in, in right to choose. Now we voted on it twice in the Senate. We put in an amendment in the budget. And by the way, for all those, the budget uh, is coming out of the conference committee. We will be voting on that Monday. And there's more money coming to the district than the history of the Commonwealth. But getting back to the uh, right to choose. So we voted for an amendment in the budget. And then the House had another version. So we voted on another version last week in the Senate to make sure that we do protect a woman's right to choose. And I know there is a proposed ballot initiative, and this is to everybody out there, they need to get a lot of signatures to get a ballot initiative on the ballot for this coming election. And I'm working to make sure that this doesn't get put on the ballot. I, I agree people have a right to vote and choose, but this is a woman's right that's been in order for over 50 years. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's terrible that it's come to this with the uh, former president putting the Supreme Judicial Committee in force because they're looking to take a lot of rights away from all of us. And we fought, and our forefathers fought and died for these rights to vote, so we got to protect the woman's right and all our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Thank you for that question. Um, much appreciated. Um, just yesterday, actually, I emceed a pro-choice rally in Plymouth. And so I totally understand the need to be a front runner when it comes to Roe v. Wade. And I will be, and I am, a front runner. I'm not waiting for people to, tell, to push me in front. I am not waiting for people to say, Katrina, this is how you should vote. And it's not only because I am a woman, but it's because I know this is a very important topic that where many rights could be taken away from us if we continue to allow this to be something that we are living with. We know that individuals who have the rights to their own bodies should 
be able to make their own choices. We also, what we also don't want to do, we want to make sure that when individuals leave Mass Massachusetts to have an abortion other places, that they're not penalized, nor is the doctor penalized because they have left Massachusetts. And that is something that if you've read and if you've seen something that has happened, definitely in the news. So when it comes to abortions, definitely it's about the right of that individual. And I want to say that individual, because not everyone identified as a woman who has a uterus. Secondly, reproductive rights, reproductive justice goes beyond abortion. Reproductive justice also is about education. Reproductive justice is, always, is also about, um, has a layer of racism, sexism, and classism. And those three isms need to be addressed before we go any further in understanding how to overturn and how to fight against Roe v. Wade. Without addressing the isms, because you're going to have women of color, women who are of uh, financial hardship, will be the more victimized in these situations for unwanted pregnancies. And I will go on again when it's my turn. Thank, Thank you, Katrina. Um, I'm just going to ask the question on behalf of the greater Brockton minority. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathleen, my bad. Okay. Okay, I'm very passionate about this topic, having come from a family of all men. So, um, I'd like to say, no uterus, no opinion, hands off my body, no government controlling our body. So yes, Massachusetts is really good, we are the leaders on this, but we have other issues, like women traveling from other red states into other states that allow abortion. Can you think about how dangerous it is for that woman having enough to deal with, well, having to make a decision in looking for a place and wondering if she's going to be criminalized and then having to wonder if the doctor is going to be criminalized. This is just really, really huge and we can't back down. We are having the conversation now we are making it so that Massachusetts is, continues to be the model for the nation, but we will continue making new things, and I am right there. Um, thank you. Thank you. So like I was, oh, let me cut off the time. As I was saying before, on behalf of the association, we just have um, a couple questions just to ask you guys. One of our questions is, what specifically will you do for small businesses in Brockton? Not the feds, the state, but you personally. What would you do for small businesses in Brockton? Well, I'd like to start off by saying thank you for the question. I'd like to start off by saying I am loving the initiative in Boston, the small business um, initiative. So there are a couple of things that I, I, I'm thinking about, I have been thinking about. Um, the first thing is currently, as a Randolph Town Councilor, the councilors are put in different subcommittees. So I'm on the um, economic subcommittee and, and, and Randolph. And I have started the conversation and talking about how do we help small businesses and help people with startup businesses. What we do know is that the majority of businesses that failed during COVID were minority owned and women owned businesses. So what are we going to do to, and I feel like it's the town responsibility to bring these businesses back to life if it's possible, and also allow opportunities for those who want to start businesses. And, and that comes from how do we look at our budget, whether it's revolving fund, where um, there's a loan process 
So this was my initial that I thought of. A loan process, because we have these offer monies, right? The best way to use our monies is to A, create opportunities in the town, fix the roads, do the, uh, make sure the water is healthy. But we also want to make sure individuals have these opportunities. Be cut, just two seconds. <laughs> and so that means putting monies aside for businesses who have not been successful and providing them funding opportunities so they can get back on their feet. And also putting funding aside for startup businesses so people could start off their businesses of their dreams and hopes that they, they could also be successful. And this will be like a revolving fund where we loan out money and as people are paying back the money, it comes back into the government. So that's the initiative that I put out just last week. Thank you, and, and that was a great question. And I've been doing this for many years, helping out small businesses. I've worked with Mass Development, Dan Rivera, who's the head of that. We've helped get funding from the state. I've put the initiative forward and had to get it approved through the state to get grants and, and low interest, uh, zero interest loans. As you know, our downtown has suffered since many years when the mall got built, it kills our downtown when one-way traffic was made. And we have so much money coming into downtown Brockton, where I represented for the past couple of years. Uh, the old Frederick Douglass Avenue, that had a whole new facility built. It's beautiful. There's a, a, a company on the corner of Frederick Douglass Avenue Main Street that has some beautiful housing initiatives upstairs, and there's a new business downstairs. And I had to work with the gas company to make sure the gas lines were put in correctly. There's a business on Central Street and Main Street, another business on Main Street, and also uh, on North Main Street. So there's so much money coming into downtown Brockton. And Robert Jenkins, who worked with our local uh, department here in Brockton, he just moved on. He's been a great friend. He's an African-American member of our community. And I've just spoke with him on the phone to congratulate him because he's going to be working with Mass Development. So we have been working together. I know Mary Walters in the audience with the Old Client Planning Council. Our local city council, because we work with our local officials to get things done. It's not just me at the state level. And my fellow state delegation, Jerry Cassidy, who represents the downtown with myself. So we have millions and millions of dollars to come into Brockton to help develop some of these businesses. On top of that, with the COVID epidemic, which we're still not completely out of, but the past few years, a lot of businesses suffered. So we got some grant money to help out some small businesses, whether it be dry cleaners, local restaurants, or whatnot because they wouldn't have survived. I know, as was mentioned, Boston, right near the state house, a lot of restaurants had closed around the pandemic. We were able to keep these businesses sustainable in the city of Brockton. Thank you. So I'm the only one in the race who's run a business for 20 years. I talk to small business owners all the time. I am interested in what they're going through. So a lot of what they're going through right now is staff shortages. Also a disruption in the supply chain that just has not recovered. So women have left whole professions that in my view aren't, weren't really respected enough. A lot of really hard jobs during the pandemic, teachers, nurses, um, I'd like to, you know, offer more for family paid leave, uh, get, get women back to work, uh, because when women are back to work, we are being inclusive, and when we do that, we work better. So uh, I will advocate for grants for small businesses and advocate for incentives for workers to get back to work. So, like I said, I'm the only one in the race who's run a small business. I am resourceful. I look to what the core of the problems are. To use a nursing metaphor, it's time to stop putting band-aids on our problems. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, um, two more questions on behalf of the association. They kind of go hand in hand, so the one of them is, what will you do so that minority business that businesses that didn't get anything in the past from the state will get some relief? And ask the second question after. Mm 
Well, I'm going to continue to meet with the business community in Brockton and all the other towns that I represent. I know that um, water is a big issue too to help small businesses. Fortunately, in Brockton, we had a water shortage several years ago. You couldn't even water your lawn, never mind helping a new business grow, so we couldn't get any new businesses. We voted for the first desalinization facility on the East Coast. And we have so much water now, it's up to the company and the city to market to other communities, not my job. We voted on that several years ago, but I know other communities like Randolph, they're meeting with other towns to come up with a backup water initiative. I know Avon, where my brother was a selectman and, and unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, they had wells and, and he would take a shower and his water would turn green, it was so bad. That's just one initiative, but for the grants that we did help the businesses that were able to get the grants, not every business knew about the grants. And we've got to do a better job marketing to get the word out for these grants because I've told these businesses how to apply, how to get their application, whether federal money, state money, or whatever it need be. And we did get millions and millions of dollars into the city, so the local mayor's office and the local city council, I'm grateful to the, as I mentioned, the city council from Brockton that are here. We have local money to help out these small businesses. So there was a lot of money coming into Brockton in the surrounding towns, Randolph, Avon, Whitman, Hanson, Halifax, and East Bridgewater to get help for these businesses. And that's why, never mind the uh, general budget, but also there was extra money coming in from the Commonwealth to help out these businesses in a wide range of initiatives. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I feel like it, it was part of my, my last answer, but continuing on with that, um, it's important that we have these initiatives. And we have to be aggressive. And when I talk about being aggressive, I, I'm talking about going out there, having conversation, and bringing the businesses with us. We can sit down and we can say, what do you need? What do you want? And I will bring it back. I don't want to bring back the information. I want to bring back the businesses. As I said, as I sit at the table, I want people to come with me. I want to learn what initiatives. I want you to work with me on initiatives. So this program that I told you about um, at the last question, um, where you know wanting to do a loan process, this isn't a decision that's just going to be made through the town. This is a decision where we are going to come. You can call me a conveyor. I bring people together. I'll bring businesses together. I'll bring the government together. I'll bring residents together. And as we sit in our think tank and try to figure out what is the best strategy to make sure that we have businesses that are going to be successful and what's going to be success and what could we do to start up businesses? This isn't a one woman show. This isn't a one man show. This isn't a one person show. It's about community coming together to make sure this happens. And that's and so that leads me into my second point is I want to look at the district as a regional process. I don't want, you know, Brockton does this thing, Randolph does this thing, Avon does this thing. How could we figure out this issue uh, about small businesses as a region? How could we come together, have the same solutions, the same information, and for all of the towns and cities in that district to be successful at the same time? Thank you. So I will help minorities to thrive. This is the topic that I will lead on that the incumbent has not led on. So I care very much about a study that was done on black maternal health care and morbidity and mortality during childbirth, black women being three times more likely to die in childbirth. So there was just a study that just came out, and guess what? They know, we know, they know now that, yes, it's true. Black women do die three times more likely. I'm a nurse. It's been on my nursing books forever. It's nothing new. We just wasted a lot of taxpayers' money on doing that study. Why was it in a study? Why? So it's out of the study, and we're at an interesting time because 
we can now uh, be creative on how this information is used going forward to serve the, the people and uh, people of color. Thank you so very much. And our last question, this is it, um, my last question on behalf of the association. If we elected Mike and um, Kathleen and Katrina, if you are elected, how will you ensure us that your office of, is representative? Oh yeah, how would you ensure us that your office is representative of the individuals of color in this district? Oh, you want to go first? I'll let you go first. Oh, you go first. Yeah. Mike Brady and I have been on this show together from the beginning, so we, um, we smile. And I, I think that's a good thing when we can smile at each other, smile with each other. Um, first of all, I would like to talk about constituent services. I have already and plan to do again next week to meet with residents in every district. Not the senator yet. However, I want to know what people are thinking. And when you know what people are thinking, that's how you know who to bring and what to bring and what issues to bring to, uh, to the State House. So I have had constituent services already in seven of the town cities in the district and I plan to have constituent services again. I'm not in office yet, but I'm going to have these services because I think it's important and I think people, again, I want to bring voices to the table. So how do I know what to bring to the table or who to bring to the table if I'm not talking to the people? And that has always, even as a town councilor, that has always been my motto to work with the people, bring the people to the table. So therefore, I have to have a conversation with the people. Thank you. Just one thing, we are running limited on our time because we do still have to have our state reps. So sorry to um, cut you guys short, but we do just want to follow up with closing remarks on this section because we do have to get through our um, state senate candidates. State Senate Representative, I'm sorry, State Representative candidate. So if I could just have um, closing remarks from each of um, you guys as a candidate, and then we can wrap up this portion. Oh, so do oh. You, I asked you. Oh, 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 Now, I want to know what you're going to do for the chronic pain community and for the addiction community. And I want answers today. Well, that's a very important question. Now, for the addiction community, I've gotten funding in the budget. We have a Brockton Addiction Center that has helped out a lot of people with addiction and is still going on. During the COVID pandemic, it was very difficult because the corner office, the governor's administration, had virtual meetings with people that does not work. You need one-on-one -on -one counseling, you need personal counseling. So we got more money for that in the budget and expanded upon this. And there was a woman, Cap Yellow, who did a yeoman's job in the city of Brockton helping people with addiction with a great staff. Now she's moved on to get a job with the school committee. As far as medications, that's all up to the doctors that... No. No, it is. No! I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm a chronic pain patient. Yes. I've been to many doctors in this area. None will prescribe me my opioid medication. I am very sick. Mm -hmm. So don't say it's up to the doctors. It's the 2016 opioid guidelines. Don't fault the doctors. If I may, that is a law that the doctors make the decision. I am not a doctor. Now, now let me finish, please. If you have problems, because I did get a call from a person this week, with a back pain and he's got up for surgery. I called the Mass Medical Board several times. 
They will not give me the name of a doctor. Do you have a primary care plan? Uh, at this point, no, because they almost killed me. Okay. Well, I don't want to eat. Exactly. No, so no, but don't I'm, tell me it's the doctor's choice. No, but the law, the law, it the, goes all the way up to the governor of the state. Yes, and the law is. It's up to the doctors to make this decision. Now, if you have a problem with your doctors, we have a health commission in the state level and a public health commission that I'm happy to reach out to them if you want to talk offline, because I'm there to help anybody with an issue. I'll be happy to talk with you right after this forum, because I had a constituent who called me today, and he's got back surgery coming up, and he was limited to how many oxycons he could get. And Unfortunately, he's got to wait because you're limited based on the doctor, not based on my decision because I'm not a medical expert, to how many meds you can get. So I'm happy to talk to you after this. Thank you. I was going to say yes. If we could finish that conversation offline because we do, we have to keep with our program that we do have scheduled for this evening. So I appreciate all the questions. But I do want to give a chance. I'm sorry, Brady and Kathleen, that I did not give you a chance to answer my last question. So I do want to provide you guys a minute each to respond to that. That's my apologies. So if you guys would like to um, respond to the question, I can read it again if you like. Um, but um, I just wanted to give you guys a fair chance. If you wouldn't mind, please. Yeah, go ahead. No, if you would read the question. Oh, sure. I thought you wanted to talk about that. So it says, if elected or re-elected, how will you assure us that your office is representative of the individuals of color in this district? Well, that's a great question. As I mentioned before, when I was on the city council, I represented a majority minority district. As a state rep, I had the first majority minority district in the city of Brockton, and this new district that has been created is a majority minority district. I also looked to hire people of a Duras background. I had a gentleman who worked for me who ended up moving on because he was of Haitian descent. He ended up moving on to run for mayor, and he has a right to move on and run for mayor. So then I reached out to the community because we have limited time of spending. We have to hire people in our offices. And I was recently able, through a lot of um, trials and tribulations, because unfortunately it doesn't pay much to, to have a staff member in your office. I have one chief of staff. I have a communications director. I have a, two part-timers. But I was able to hire a young lady who was of Haitian descent to help represent my district in a better manner. And a lot of the friends that I have, I've had office hours and a lot of the Council on Aging, the high rises. Unfortunately, during COVID, we couldn't have office hours because everything was closed. And I also meet with residents in their own homes, our businesses in their own place of business. So I'm available 24-7. I've known as a 24-7 counselor. I'm always available. And, and I joke because I am single, I'd probably be divorced already if I was married because I'm never home. I, I get calls from people 10 o'clock at night from uh, 7 in the morning. And uh, I'm always available to represent the community. And another program, I want to continue to get the funding. The Student Opportunity Act is being implemented. It's the highest increase of student funding in the history of the Commonwealth. The local aid has increased higher than ever been. And I want to just to continue to do my job as I always have done. And I want to thank you here, everybody, for your support. And thank you for showing up on this warm Sunday. I always want to say follow the money. So when I'm senator, I'll make sure that funds are distributed equitably. You and I need this incumbent, Walter Timothy, out. He's not representing the people. I'm the only pro-choice and pro-LGBT and pro-immigrant rights candidate in the race. I will look at the core of the problem not put band-aids on the problem, and not put things to study so that we don't address them. So I appreciate everyone for showing up, um, and I'll try to bring each and every one of you to State Senate with me. Thank you. So that concludes our conversation portion with our State Senate um, candidates, and we could just give them another round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to begin our portion for our state rep. And, and if I may Please. just oh, yes. go ahead. back to our good friend who's here, our other candidate, which is not the district in Brockton, is not here. I, I do want to say that the Senate voted 40 to 0. There was no opposition to give a woman's right to choose this past week. Well, he can show up and let everyone know how he feels then. Absolutely.
Okay, thank you. So um, up next, if we're all ready to begin, um, we'll start our state rep portion for 11th Plymouth District. We have two candidates here and one sticker candidate. Um, tonight we do have Shirley Asak and Rita Mendez. Um, first, I would like to welcome Shirley Asak to speak first. Shirley. Well, hello everybody. Thank you to the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association for hosting us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Shirley Asak, and I'm running to be your next state representative for the 11th Plymouth District. Thank you, Eve. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. At the age of seven, I immigrated to the United States from Lebanon with my parents and my younger sister, Joyce Asak, current vice chair of the Brockton School Committee. We're very proud of that. When I arrived in the U.S., I landed in the heart of Brockton, where I lived with my aunt and her family on Belmont Avenue. I attended the Ellis Brett Franklin School, North Junior High, and graduated from Brockton High School, class of 1988. English is actually my third language. I'm fluent in French and the Lebanese dialect of uh, Arabic. When I first immigrated to the United States, I didn't speak a word of English. As I started my education in Brockton uh, schools, great resources in the Brockton Public School District allowed me to become the woman I am today. And my appreciation for this guides my actions and my role as an elected official. Just mentioning, talking about education, I have been endorsed by the Democrats for Educational Reform, which I'm very proud of because if anybody knows about endorsements, it, these are long questionnaires and a lot of questions that are asked, and it's nice to hear that you align with an, with an organization. I went on to obtain my undergraduate degree in Paris. After working in France for several, several years, following graduation, I returned to Brockton to stop my family I raised my two daughters, Alexandra and Georgina, in the, in the city. They attended Brockton Public Schools, graduated from Brockton High School in 2019 and in 2021, and are now in college, one at Boston College and my other daughters at Harvard. My girls are products of the Brockton Public School System as they attended Brockton Public Schools for the entirety of their education. We have a great school system with great administrators, educators, and students. When there was millions of dollars being cut from our Chapter 70 funding to our schools, I advocated for equitable education for all. These are our kids. They are our future. Equitable education and ensuring that their schools are adequately funded to propel them onto a path towards success is a topic that is of utmost importance to me. So I'm vested in the city of Brockton. I've owned a small business. Um, many of you I've met that way, Prep Posh Flowers. I own the business since 2005. And as a female Lebanese immigrant, I am a minority business owner in this city. And I'm honored to be at this Greater Brockton Minority Business Association Forum today. Small business is vital to our local economy. I know the struggles of being a small business owner and will continue to advocate for small business growth within our district at the state level. I have served as the Brockton City Council for the past nine years with my colleague, Councilor at Large Rodriguez. I've served as the City Council President in 2020, Chair of the Ordinance Committee this year, and on all the other subcommittees, including Traffic Commission, Public Safety, Accounts, Real Estate, both of which I've chaired in the Beautification Committee. I believe that experience is paramount to representation at the state level. Serving on the city council for nine years, I deeply understand the issues we face as a city and have developed a strong listening ear. Those of you who, who have um, worked with me know that my votes and my advocacy is informed by my constituents. I'm actually the only candidate running that has worked on legislation, ordinances that has had ordinances passed in the city. I promise to be a listening ear and your voice. Remember that this race is about you, and I have the time to dedicate to you. My focus is on Brockton. As your state representative, I will work tirelessly to ensure that Brockton receives the appropriate state resources to help fight for equitable funding and education 
expand economic development, fight crime, and increase public safety. I will advocate for better services for our senior citizens and improve infrastructure. I aim to work with law enforcement, mental health professionals, and the medical community to address the opioid epidemic that remains to be a major issue in our city. I will work for the residents of the 11th Plymouth District to address issues that impact our quality of life and help us raise our families with pride in Brockton. I believe in Brockton. I've seen positive changes. It is through discussion and circulation of ideas, and most importantly, the unwavering wavering conviction that there is hope for improvement, that positive change can be achieved. I need your support to continue to enact such a change, so I ask you to send your city councilor to work for you on Beacon Hill. I humbly ask for your vote and the support of your family and friends for the primary election on Tuesday, September 6th. Please vote Shirley Azak. For more information, please visit my website, shirleyasak.com, and you can also contact me via email at shirleyasakbrockton at gmail.com, but I always have my cell phone on me, so you can always call me, 508-451-1632. I thank you. Next up, we have Rita Mendez. Hello, everybody hear me, okay. Hi, so I am um, Councilor Rita Mendez, and um, I'm running for state representative. It's such an honor to be here um, tonight in this forum, especially when we talk about small um, businesses and the such of needs in the city. So I first got elected to city council in um, 2019, and it was such a, a great experience. When I first ran for to become a city councilor, I did not know what was coming ahead of me. Neither one of us knew. Uh, three months later, we got hit with the COVID pandemic, and that has been my experience in the city council, uh, dealing with the whole pandemic and how our communities and how Brockton really got affected and hit hard by the pandemic. So they always bring in the, the vaccine bus for clinics to try to get as most people as I possibly could getting them vaccinated, giving out PPE to um, the people, low income people that really need it, passing out food, anything that we could really do to help our community. And what became clear is that when we work as a city councilor, we're dependent on the state to send us funding so we can do our job. We're dependent on really the state to give us the resources so that we can continue and we know how to best allocate the resources to the communities that it's most in need. And what we find is that most of it, we're getting the crumbs, we're getting the leftovers, we're getting what we was gonna get anyways, not really the true advocacy to know and understand the needs of that community especially speaking about small businesses owners. We had businesses owners that couldn't get any of the grant money the, because a lot of their tax returns weren't filed appropriately, correctly. So when you're going in and you're getting out the grants and you're applying for all of these different things and resources, oh, it's based on your expenses. And you are a small business owners that file your taxes, have no expenses, so therefore you don't qualify. There's clearly something very wrong with that formula because every small business owner clearly has expenses. So the more you want to do for your community, the more you want to fight, the more you see the issues, the more you feel that you need to be at the state level, sitting at that table, advocating for the community that truly needs to be uh, to have a voice there, not just to speak for them, to, to actually fight and bring in funding to fund our small businesses. We were going over to small businesses, giving them applications, providing them information, letting them know what they could do in order to be able to apply for funding, to hope to help them get qualified in order to get them through the bad times and the difficult times. So I'm running to really be in the community, not just when uh, the time is 
uh, convenient, but especially when it's very difficult times to be there, to listen to the concerns, listen to the issues, listen to the <laughs> criticism, listen to the things that we're lacking as a city, whether it's on education, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in our small businesses, to be there to fight for our community. So I'm originally from Brazil. I came to this country when I was 12 years old, did not speak a word of English, but I went to public education. I was able to graduate from Brockton High School. I went to Massasoit. I was able to graduate with honors from Massasoit. From there, I started um, my own real estate um, business out of um, school, and I was selling houses until the 2008 market crash, and that's when I realized I lost everything. I lost my home, lost my business, lost everything, had to start from scratch. The solution was that I looked at it as an opportunity. I was still young, and I still had the energy to keep on fighting, to become somebody in this country, because I believe this is the land of opportunity. This is where we come to work hard in order for us to get ahead in life. I believed in that, and I didn't give up. Almost gave up, but I didn't give up. Went back to school, went to UMass Dartmouth. I got my undergrad there, then went to law school and opened my own law practice. I practiced immigration, and I continue to work in the community as um, interpreter, as an attorney, advocating for kids, advocating for our community. But there's a lot of businesses during the pandemic that are failing, that are going through the same crisis that I went in the past. And we need to keep pushing forward to bring assistance and to truly help and advocate. So I'm here to represent the city of Brockton. I'm here to represent each and every one of you. I'm here to represent those who really don't have the voice to know their rights, to know that they can be represented in the state level. And I'm here to work for the people. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. So now I want to open it up to everybody if anybody has a question. And then I'm going to ask a question that I want. Anybody? Okay, I'll ask the question. It's fine. So I'm going to basically ask you the same questions that I asked before on behalf of the association. Um, what specifically will you do for the small businesses in Brockton? Not the feds, the state, but you as, a, as an elected state rep. Thank you for that question. Um, so what I didn't mention is that for the past nine, nine years plus, um, I have been working with the small businesses in Brockton. I am a constant supporter from day one of the Montello Business Association, who has actually, they were the first ones to endorse, endorse me the second I suggested that I told them that I was running. So I have worked with the businesses in our area in Brockton. Um, and I will continue to do that. I will continue to uh, work with them hands-on, one-on-one. I haven't missed them. I haven't missed a meeting. And I always joke around. I think I've been to meetings when they haven't been to them. Um, so there, have we have a lot of small businesses in Brockton. They are our backbone. We will continue to support them. We will create. Um, we will create laws that will make sense. They, we will create laws that are enforceable. We will create laws that support them and help bring in, uh, help them be, their businesses flourish, whether it's um, you know, through COVID or through without, or any, any type of uh, an emergency. But I do have to say, a lot of businesses did suffer during, um, during COVID. And I, I remember calling some of them and speaking to them one-on-one, -on -one, and they had applied to many grants through the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, and they weren't eligible for a lot of funding. It wasn't I mean, these are businesses that had been in business for over 20 years, but for whatever reason, they didn't get the funding. And we, we fought, and then there was a second round of uh, funding. We tried our best to get, get these small businesses funding, but sadly, sometimes I think we need, to, um, we need to work together at the state level or at the federal level to make sure that there's uh, government programs that are protecting these small businesses. So even though a lot of them suffered, um, they were discouraged. I, my business was one of them. I, my business didn't make it through COVID. I was in the hospitality business. So, and I wasn't eligible for a lot of the funding. So what we need to do is work one-on-one -on -one with these businesses like I have been in the past, past nine plus years to find out what their needs are and to make sure that they take advantage of programs similar to this program that you, you've all started here that's funded through the government, make sure that 
uh, small businesses are aware of what's out there, what Brockton has to offer, where, where the funding is, and how we can help them. So I'm here to facilitate, to, to announce the programs, and to help develop them. Thank you. The reality is, is when SBA, they have programs for small businesses, they assume that these small business owners, they have lawyers, they have CPA, they have accountants, that all of their financial life and their business life, it's in order, just like how great their uh, small businesses succeed. They're great at making their food, they're great in selling their product, they're great at what they do, but they are terrible in keeping the books and actually having things there in place and organized. So they're not making these programs for the business owners that it's really there that does not speak the language, does not English is not their first language, that doesn't understand the complexities of compliance and having all of these different things in order. It's confusing, it's complicated for me as an attorney to navigate that system and go through that. So the first thing we need to do is to really provide these small businesses with funding, but not just give them money and here you go, because then it's just continue on with the same issues, but provide training, provide education, providing support, provide access in their own language, providing them with the tools that they need in order to succeed, whatever that is. They'll tell us what they need, but to be able, when they make a phone call, the people that are there to assist these small business, that they should be there to assist and not just getting paid by our government and not really getting back with, to the small businesses in time. Because when they apply for funding, that money is crucial, whether they're gonna stay open or whether they're gonna be closed. So it needs to be time sensitive. We need to act quick. And it's not just going to some random line, wait in line and take forever and don't hear anything back or by the time when you hear it, oh, by the way, we sent you 10,000 emails and you haven't gotten back to us with emails while they're busy running their business. They're not checking on emails. So you see the complexity that we have when it comes to small businesses. And it's not a job that we do it alone. We did together, but it's possible, it's do it. We just need priorities and you need to understand the issues and make sure we get it done. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Attorney Mendez, but I just want to clarify that the funding that came through to COVID, the first few rounds, I, I, we're here to help minority businesses. Yes, we can help them with language. We can help them with directing them in the right direction. But it was, there were businesses that had been in business for over 25 years that spoke perfect English, that filled out applications, and that still didn't benefit. So I just want to clarify that there were, there were a lot of businesses that did not get funding, did not get help, that had to close their doors. And even though I'm minority, we represent minority businesses, but it affected everybody. And that's what um, I just wanted to clarify that because that was a big misconception um, because we had businesses that closed doors throughout the city. Thank you. Does anybody want to ask a question? Okay, I'll ask another one. Um, if elected, how will you ensure us that your office is representative of the individuals of color in this district? Thank you. So Brockton has been a minority majority city since I've been in it. It's, it's a, the whole city's minority majority. And if you look at my campaigns, whether it was for city council or right now for state rep, I have of every different ethnicities, uh, cultures that are involved in this, in my campaign, and I hope to bring that vision to the state level. Um, there's, to me, this is Brockton, this is our community, this is, uh, we're all well represented here, and I hope to be able to bring that to, to the State House. you can be sure that uh, my office will be very representative of this community. And the fact that I can speak Portuguese, I speak Spanish, I understand the Cape Breton Creoles, and my office for um, the law office 
We have um, Hispanics, we have Americans, we have Brazilians, and also in my campaigns, we have Haitians, we have Americans, we have Brazilians, we have everything, because that's what Brockton is. So it's impossible to represent Brockton if we're not representing the community. So everywhere around us, and we look, it's a diverse community, and that's what I'm most proud of. So yes, the people will be able to freely connect with me, with my office, and the language that they best choose, and they can be assured that they will be represented. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Does anybody want to ask a question? Between this night to five, they jump and to have you know meeting to look for funding. They don't receive funding for, for uh, from the state to hire, let's say, a full-time executive director, someone who can write grant. Like you know, in the Asian community or the Cape Breton community, you you may have a lot of organization, but if they don't have funding to to hire full-time people to write grant to when those organizations, they cannot, you know, provide, you know, proper services to, to their, their community. And right now, our organization, we are meeting at the Kibetian Association. But when I go there, you know, during the day for a meeting with Moises, I see a lot of people doing COVID, but, you know, everybody is like, you know, sitting next to each other. My question to you, if, you know, when, you know, one of you will be elected, what about, you know, find, you know, find the fund, necessary fund for those organizations? Not only they can hire full-time employees to win those organizations, but in Boston, I know a lot of, you know, non-profit organizations, they receive funding to build their, their own headquarters. That's, you know, where they are after school program, where they have, you know, program for kids, for women. What this specifically you will do when you are elected, you know, to provide, to find funds for those non-profit organizations? Thank you, Eve, for that question. Yeah. So, I wish I could tell you we're going to give funding like right off the bat, but it, I think working together, working with our existing state delegation, this is this is a goal that can that we can accomplish in the future. First of all, thank you to our nonprofits because they were a big a big strength. They were um, you know they did a lot of the hard work. They did a lot of the work in the community. So thank you for all you do. And. I know Haitian Community Partners, Cape Verdean Association, you, you all played a huge role in, in the city of Brockton during COVID and prior to COVID. I mean, this is, we're a, a diverse community and these are the two organization that, organizations that have helped, um, you know, immigrants that are in the city of Brockton, whether it's with everyday issues or with COVID issues. So thank you for that. I, I feel as one of the reasons I'm running for state rep, if not the main reason, is to advocate for funding for issues similar to this. You do deserve to have full-time um, people who are making money so they don't have to run around and go to a million job, and I know many of you do. You have businesses, you have families, but you know, you're know you giving your time to, these, uh, to your nonprofit to help people. So I will work together because I'm a big believer that one person alone not on the city council and not in the state legislation can do anything alone, but work together with our state delegation to get work on getting funding in the budget for, for, the, for your organizations. I was, I have to tell you, I was very happy, even though there was, a, um, we didn't get a lot of funds for small businesses, but when the mayor, uh, Mayor Sullivan brought up the program that he was going to give funding to nonprofits in the city of Brockton from the ARPA funds, 
I was very happy to hear that a lot of the nonprofits took advantage of that. I wish, I know majority of them got around 40 something thousand dollars. I wish it was more, and maybe that's something we can work on to, um, you know, to expand that, to get more funding for our nonprofits um, for Brockton. Thank you. The money is there for the nonprofits. The issue is that, just like how you said, we need the grant writers to be able to identify, to find out that the, there is money there, and to have that resources, have someone that is actively going after these fundings. Because there is funding there, other communities are getting them, just like how you described. It's just that we are not actively pursuing them and going after. So it's really going back to the, uh, these nonprofits, seeing the great work that they're doing in the city, seeing how their work is instrumental and in providing them with that resources, with that help, with that assistance. So that way, listen, there's this program that you would be able to qualify. How can we help you? So to make sure that these um, great nonprofits receive additional funding. So yes, we do need more funding for Brockton, and we need to be actively looking for it. Um, the mayor's program was great, but I do think that there's org organization in the city that was key in order to be able to receive that funding and didn't get it automatically, the money, knowing the great work that the organizations did, especially during COVID. So it, it also takes uh, recognizing that that some organizations are so instrumental to the city of Brockton, pushing the city forward, that we need to go to them, even if they don't come to us, and say, listen, we want to help. We're going to be earmarking some money to your organization. But other than that, there's these great programs, and I'm going to help you apply for it and get the money, get the resources, so we can all benefit in the city of Brockton, because they are the ones who really in the front lines when the crisis hit, they immediately help and assist our residents. So we, we do need to provide them with that support. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. We have another question. much for that question and I did um, address a little bit uh, when I was um, speaking earlier that is an issue that is that is a problem and, and you're right I'm not gonna sit here and make promises to you because when it comes when we get there to the state house our job as representatives of this city is to go 
and meet with each other state representative and let them know about the city of Brockton because when it comes time to vote for crucial things like this, it's good when we already had a, a relationship and, and get to know that colleague that is going to be voting on things that is going to benefit our city. So uh, what I was doing as a city councilor when COVID hit is really going to the small businesses owners, the communities, and letting them know about the programs and to apply for just how he said. Then the calls start coming and what are the calls? We can, we can get qualified, we can get the funding, it requires X, Y, and Z, and we just opened uh, during COVID, and these benefits is for when you open, we were open a year before COVID, but now we're opening up our doors and we're getting things done, but we don't have the two years of tax return, or we don't have whatever the, the hurdles may be, and that really got people uh, discouraged to keep on pushing forward because they get up every day in the morning and that that business is their life that's where the the family works together and they are working to benefit our community providing jobs so when that storefront when that business is closed down we don't know when we're going to get another one and it's just that reoccurring cycle so it is a problem it is an issue and what i can tell you is i'm going to be here to listen and to also go after the funding, go after the formula and see how we can um, change it in a way to bring equity and to make sure that the people that need the most will be able to get that money. It comes down to the people that needs the most. People that needs the most are being left out of it just because however the formula was made. So we need to go back and advocate for precisely that community. And I thank you for that because that did happen in Brockton a lot, a lot, more than we would like to. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Cindy, for that question. So I agree with you and I'm not waiting to be a state representative to advocate for you. So I have been, I spoke to the mayor about this. It was a major problem when we had small businesses closing and not getting funding. So I spoke to him on numerous times about, even after we got the ARPA funds for the nonprofits, I'm like, what about our small businesses? So I know as a city council, we're not in charge of, um, we can't uh, bring in funding. We can only uh, you know, pass the budget, but I have spoken to him. He said there was something coming along for small businesses, so I hope that's the case. But I will continue to ask and I will continue to look and if I'm successful as your next state representative, that will be one of the first things that I'll look at in the budget to earmark funding for small businesses. Because once again, the mom and pop shops are the backbone of the city. They're the backbone, the residents and the small businesses are our backbone and I know that. And that's why I, I know people always talk to us about tax relief and you know paying taxes in Brockton. And that's why I always say we need to build our commercial base. We need to bring in some of the big business so we can help our small businesses and our residents. So these are things that I, I will be working on starting, you know, the one the minute I'm elected, that's what I will be working on. So but I'm I'm working on it now. So I'm not this is something that has to happen now. We can't wait until some, we're elected and um, waiting for a budget to put in funding for our small business. You need to be taken care of now. Thank you. Just, just a big, big question, uh, a big question on uh, the way the state is doing business with, with us, my business. Every year, I'm talking to the same, 4.8 billion in contracts. With vendors. Last year, yeah, 2000, yeah, during COVID 2021, out of 4.8, they spent only 25 million with Latinx and I would say minority businesses. They have a, a system in place for almost 10 years. You know, probably a lot of people know about home buyers. You have to be a vendor. For the past, I would say, 12 years. Even someone who can have the opportunity to meet with the governor, a governor from the Party to Baker, one-on-one, -on -one, you meet with them. 
they may give you a specific person from that institution to deal with. But trust me, the, end, the answer always, you go on the website, you apply. Yeah. Myself, you know, I'm, you know I, I know a little bit about you know, what I can do. Time to time, I can find you know, some contracts with, with the state. But probably 99% of us will get lost using uh, you know, contracts. As an elected, you know, state rep, how do you, what do you think you can do to help minority business to manage, to know how to use better the system so they can be, for example, a vendor? I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's not easy. The only answer they, they are for you Go on the website and you know you do it yourself. It doesn't work that way. For ninety percent of us. Well, even though you go on the website, they still don't make it easy. No matter my name's Stefano, I own a internet service company here local University of Rockville. So I'm actually registered to come by, but even though you go and can navigate the website and it comes to bond certificates, you know, they make it like you know, you could always use certain quota or even you could make certain amount of sales like prior to you, you know. Yeah, but I, I can do specific answer, guys, you know, when you are there, you know, how to deal, what to propose. To find, like, you know, I would just, you know, COVID-19, BSA, Nation, Creole, and, and so on. To find contract to, with DBH, for example, I have to go under a giant, you know, company. If the state is paying, let's say, maybe $20,000 for, for a 30 seconds for Sometimes you got only 5000 But if you don't go under this big company, you won't get anything. But you know, guys, you have to stop. You have to stop. Do you want to go first? Or you want to go first? Thank you for that question. Um, don't think easier answer to that but really to provide information provide education and provide resources to these small businesses owners so that they are able especially the minority business owners so that they are able to fairly compete in the market it almost as if we need a, a liaison a department to really be there to assist and to let people know and to not wait until they come to us because we come up with all these departments and great names and fancy programs and acronyms and whatever they're called. But if we're not actively going out to the businesses and letting them know, listen, you do X, Y, and Z. So um, this, this, this um, state website that you can go in your plan and be able to get better jobs. This is how it gets done. Bring me your documentations. We'll help you get applied and get it going. So I, I'm really pro-labor and pro-advocate, and I'm, I'm happy, and I've been endorsed by the uh, labor unions, and I really want to work more with the, the unions also to, to see how we can help the community at large to be able to benefit from these programs and be able to get the better jobs, to be able to get the better contracts, to be able to get the fairly paid wages. And this, we actively need to go after the, the businesses and tell them this is what the programs are and this is how I'm going to be able to help you. Make sure you get all your stuff in order and we'll do it together. It has to be the only way. It, it doesn't seem like there's something that you can just tell them to go to this website and expect them to navigate on their own, that they're going to be able to be successful in doing it. And it's something that we need to see more money coming to our businesses in the city of Brockton so we can be employing more people and see the city uh, moving forward successfully. Thank you. Thank you again for that question. So your question was, what would, can we do? So I will tell you that we, we have a similar situation here in the city of Brockton. We have a lot of programs. We have a funding that comes into the city, but 
a lot of our minority community doesn't find out about them because there's a language barrier or because they don't know the process. Well, I know one thing that worked, and when the Brockton Redevelopment Authority hired a woman by the name of um, Delsa Mendez, she made a big difference. So she made a big difference, and I, I know that maybe doing something like that, bringing somebody in at the state level to be able to help with this, you know, to help uh, our minority community, that somebody that's multilingual or maybe multiple people in, in, you know, in the languages that we need here for the city of Brockton. So that's what I would suggest. And that's what I'd advocate for. And I, you know, and these things come up because the discussion's open, because you bring it up to me. If you hadn't brought it up, I wouldn't have an idea because I, you know, we don't go on to the city website, but um, for the same, you know, for the same reason. So I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you very much. Okay, does someone else have a question? smaller playing field into like a larger pond you know, from councilors to uh, state reps. <clears throat> what uh, or how did you and what will you do to like, if you're going to write something up kind, you know, you're going to try to do legislation I would think, right? So you're going to try to um, identify a problem, come up with a solution or, or maybe um, think you can contribute to a solution, so you might co-author something. Um, like, what did you do, what will you do to, like, initiate something, spearhead something, you know, that would maybe come up with a solution um, for a problem that you might identify, but how do you identify, what do you do? Like, I'm not really sure how to word it, but you get the gist of what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I got it. So thank you, Frank, for that question. So our job as city councilors, the number one job of a city councilor is we, our powers are in our ordinances. So I am proud to say that as a city councilor for the past nine years, I have, I have written and sponsored ordinances and had them passed. Um, and these ordinances came about because of issues, quality of life issues that we wanted to make better. Um, you know, each one of the ordinances, I've written about four ordinances, and each one of them is it dealt with a specific, uh, specific issue that we tried to regulate or make better or enforce. So at the state level, I'm hoping to do the same thing, um, to write legislation that is, in th that laws that make sense, laws that will uh, better the qu uh, quality of life, and it's, it's laws similar to what's gonna come, going to come up in forums similar to this. Laws that will help small businesses. Laws that will help uh, students, you know, at costs of uh, education. Laws that will, uh, our infrastructure. Laws for our senior citizens, for better housing, to get better funding. So these are all, we are ruled by Mass General Law. Mass General Law trumps city ordinances, so I am there. I hope to be able to write laws to be able to better our community. Thank you for your question. The way to identify issues is actually being available to the community, for the community, to be able to pick up the phone and, and get call them back, answer their questions. And a lot of times when they start calling you, and you see that um, there's not an easy answer because at the moment, the, the law is currently not there yet. That's when you start then researching more, looking more into it, and it's a process. Um, an example, I had someone call me and they wanted to get um, his son to uh, pre-K, but in order, in order to qualify, it wasn't even pre-K, it's a like head start, even before the pre-K. But in order to qualify, they need to make a certain amount of money. But he works by himself, and the wife stays at home watching for the baby, and he makes just a little bit more than what the amount is in order to be able to qualify for that program. So therefore, 
no longer qualifies and then the mother needs to stay at home and then the family is in a financial hardship because of the formula, because of, of whatever the amount is. So when issues like this comes, then you know that there are more people in that situation. Then you start investigating, then you start looking, then you start researching. So as an attorney and having the legal experiences and um, I really wanted to look into these laws, seeing what these issues are that are mainly affecting our community and how we can improve the quality of life of our residents. How can we make sure that our residents are taken care of for and that we can meet them where they are. They're not gonna come to us perfect and that's our job to not just go to the state house and uh, speak for them they don't need speakers to speak for them. They need people that will act on their behalf, that will actually do the job and get it done and actually benefit them directly. So it's our job to really take the time to listen from our community, and I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap up this portion of our state rep. Um, I just want to provide, um, Shirley Reed, if you want to take one minute to just provide some closing statements for yours, and then we'll wrap up our candidate conversation. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. I'm, um, once again, I'm the only candidate that has the experience to hit the ground running if elected as your next um, state representative. I'm the only candidate that has worked on legislation, that has worked on ordinances and had them pass in the city of Brockton. I know this district, I've lived in it and worked in it for over 20 years. I've supported the residents, I've supported the businesses, I've worked for the betterment of Brockton. So I ask you to please vote for Shirley Azak, the state representative, on September 6th so we can continue to work together for everyone in Brockton. There's, all we want is what's best for Brockton. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity of being here tonight. The criticism that I hear over and over again is that minority communities do not go out there and vote. What I'm asking you to do here tonight is to make sure you do go out and you vote on September 6th. I know a lot of people know that there is an election in November, but it's very hard to know that there's an election in September, especially after the Labor Day holiday, when people are concerned about kids going back to school or coming back from a vacation. And that was done intentionally. That was done to suppress the vote. So I'm asking the community, the residents, the city of Brockton to stand up and make your voices heard. Make your voices heard. That's what I'm asking you to do. Do not give up your right to go out there and vote. So I'm asking for your support on September 6th. And um, my phone number is 508-577-0083. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And it was a pleasure being here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And this concludes our program. I would like to thank all of our candidates that came and participated. I want to thank Brockton Community Access and also the Greater Brockton Minority Business Association President Eves as well for um, organizing this event. Um, yeah, if you are a member of our association, please stay because we are having a meeting. But before we end, I do want to um, welcome up a member of Tanisha Sullivan's CAM team to come and speak about her platform. Good afternoon, early evening. Thank you so much for convening this uh, today. Um, I appreciate the platform. Um, it's really critically important that we, our citizens have an opportunity to hear from people that they want to represent them. I am Cheryl Clyburn Crawford. I'm the campaign manager for Tanisha Sullivan, who is running for Secretary of State. First thing I want to say is Tanisha is 100% behind the greater Brockton Minority Business Association in every way. And it's really interesting some of the questions that just came up because those are questions for the Secretary of State, right? Like when most people think about the Secretary of State's office, what they think about is the elections. That is critical that we have fair and inclusive elections. 
We get that, and that's the part that we talk about the most. But the part that really resonates here is about corporations. And one of the things that, you know, that that office does, every business comes through the Secretary of State's office. Where does that work have to get done? At the Secretary of State's office on that level. One of the things that I know my boss, Tanisha Sullivan, who's running for Secretary of State, wants to do is to simplify that process. As the gentleman said, that it's really difficult navigating the website, it's, uh, you know, that it's really challenging to find resources that can support small businesses. That is what she wants to do, is simplify, simplify that process and also add a lens of equity to that. Tanisha is a 20-year corporate attorney. She is very familiar with how that process works and understands it inside and out. She's also a civil rights leader. She's the president of the NAACP Boston branch. And with that kind of experience, that's what she wants to bring to that office. The equity piece, you know, around making it such that your small micro businesses, your corner store, you know, your little cupcake shops are not competing with the cheesecake factories, right? Like though you pay the same price to do Massachusetts is the most expensive place to start a business in the country. That's a fact. I'm not gonna steal her thunder. I'm waiting for her to come down here and talk to you. I just wanted to tell you, because I was jumping out of my seat, you're talking about corporations and how to make them better and how to make them more accessible. That's the office. You need Tanisha in that office to help navigate these kinds of processes. How to make the website simpler, to put a link on it that takes you to different resources that helps you understand how to get your business going. I'm excited to be her campaign manager. I'm the executive director of Mass Vote. I took a leave of absence so that I could run this partisan campaign, right? But we understand how critically it is important to have the right people in place. Elections have consequences. I mean, I could spend the rest of the evening. I won't do that. I know you all are continuing with your meeting. But elections have consequences. Who you elect, who you go out and vote for on September 6th, because our elections are won in the primary for the most part, you cannot skip September 6th. It's critically important. We just passed the Votes Act. The voter registration deadline has been reduced from 20 days to 10 days. Make sure everybody you know, your friends, your colleagues, your, your foes, everybody, right? Make sure that they're registered to vote in time so that they can vote September 6th. And I humbly stand here and ask you to consider voting for Tanisha Sullivan for Secretary of State. Thank you. Well, like I said before, I want to thank everybody for coming to our candidate discussion today. That does conclude for the evening. Um, everybody have a great night. If you want to join our next meeting, it will be August 14th at the Cape Verdean Association.